Welcome, everyone. So, uh, back for Brown Bag History. Uh, today's topic is uh, internment camp on Mount Revelstoke during World War I. This is still a topic that's not really well known in Canada. Uh, there is a, um, a film that was made a couple of years ago called That Never Happened, and it's now available on, um, on iTunes, and it's also uh, available on uh, CBC Docs. Um, and it was, it's the story of the First World War internment camp program <coughs> in Canada. And he called it That Never Happened because the filmmaker, Lee Boyko, is of uh, Ukrainian descent. And he'd heard the story in his family. And uh, when he was in high school, the, they were doing projects and he wanted to, to do a project on the World War I internment camps. And his teacher said, that never happened. So um, it gave him an impetus to do some more research and also gave him a perfect title for his film. Uh, so that film is available. There is also, I'll maybe see if I can find them after the talk if anyone wants to stick around later. As part of their research, they did a series called The Camp. So they did a film on each of the camps across Canada. So. Um, Bit of the backstory then, but the outbreak of World War I, there were um, more than 170,000 Ukrainian people living across Canada. Uh, the government of Canada had been encouraging immigration from Eastern Europe uh, to settle the West, to you know, farm the, the prairie provinces. So they'd actually had a program where they were encouraging that immigration. But then by 1913, there was a, um, um, a, a recession and a lot of unemployment across the country. So a lot of these men who had come over, uh, yes, they'd established farms, but most people couldn't make a living just on a farm. So they were out in the workforce as well. So at the outbreak of World War I, there was this huge workforce of uh, men from Eastern Europe, um, and at the time, the Ukraine was part of the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, along with uh, Germany, were the countries that the, that the uh, British Empire was at war with. So uh, people from the Ukraine and other Eastern European countries, just by virtue of their Austrian passports were considered enemy aliens. And um, in, so just at, at the outbreak of war, the uh, Canadian government established the War Measures Act, and that allowed them to um, create internment camps across the, the country and to detain uh, people from the enemy countries, so Germany and uh, Austria. Uh, but the interesting thing is that um, throughout the, the period of the war, most of the people who were uh, interned were uh, civilians from uh, the Ukraine and some of the other Euro Eastern European countries as well. There were not that many Germans interned. Um, so it, it was definitely, um, as well as you know, as, as what what the government of Canada was saying was that it was a um, a move to control the enemy alien population in the country, but more than that, it was an economic move because uh, they then didn't have to deal with these unemployed men uh, throughout the the country. Uh, so the man who was put in charge of the internment operations was named uh, General William Otter. And uh, he was a retired career soldier um, with uh, experience during the Fenian raids in 1866, the Northwest Rebellion of 1885, and he was also a commander in the Boer War. Uh, so he was put in charge of the internment operations. 
and uh, he formed a partnership with uh, James Bernard Harkin, who was the Dominion Parks Commissioner, and um, th together they came up with this plan for um, camps throughout the country. So the idea was to build camps in national parks, and uh, <coughs> so the, the prisoners would be under the control of the Dominion government, uh, and it would also give them a workforce to do uh, projects uh, within the parks. Um, well, just going to backtrack a bit. I forgot to do our um, acknowledgement. So when we uh, start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the, acknowledging the land traditions and cultures of the Sequipmec, the Tanaha, the Sanayat, and the Silks people. Um, so as part of the, uh, the War Measures Act, uh, they stated that the governor and council shall have power to do and authorize such acts and things and to make from time to time such orders and regulations as he may by reason of the existence of real or apprehended war, invasion or insurrection, deem necessary or advisable for the security, defense, peace, order and welfare of Canada. So it's a pretty broad act and it certainly gave them a lot of leeway with, within that. Um, the, the prisoners were expected to work six days a week at 25 cents a day, and most had earned, the, the going wage at that time was a uh, dollar per day or more in uh, most labor jobs. Um, and uh, and the, the report of um, William Otter, which he submitted after, the, the wor after World War I in uh, September of 1920, uh, he stated that uh, from 1914 to 1920, a total of 8,579 uh, male prisoners were interned throughout Canada. And uh, they were um, uh, Austro-Hungarians, Austro which included uh, Croats, Ruthenians, Slovaks, Czechs, and, uh, and Ukrainians, were 5,964. Um, there were 99 Bulgarians, 2,009 Germans, 205 Turks and a few of uh, other nationalities. And uh, the report by Otter said that of the total interned, not more than 3,138 could be correctly classed as prisoners of war, that is captured in arms or belonging to enemy reserves, the remainder being civilians who under the Hague regulations became liable to internment as considered to be agents attached to the army or persons whose activity is of service in the war. It is also suspected, and this is from Otter's own report, he said it is also suspected that the tendency of municipalities to unload their indigent was the cause of the confinement of not a few. <laughs> uh, and you know, that, I think that was definitely the, the motivation in a lot in, in the case here. Um, so this is um, from the, the report. And they're saying that about uh, the 5,000 of them were actually from the Ukraine, and uh, 954 were from other Austro Hungarian countries. So, a total of uh, 8,579 people were interned during that the period of the First World War. So, uh, Revelstoke already did have a Ukrainian community at that time, but and uh, most of the Ukrainian settlers had uh, uh, acquired farm property south of town, uh, the area known as Mount Karshe, so between six to 10 miles south of town, the Mount Karshe settlements. A lot of them were, were living and farming there. Uh, the first uh, Ukrainian settlers had come there about uh, 1908 or 1907 in that area, and um, then encouraged other uh, family members to come. This was a picture of the the community probably taken about the 1950s. So they had established community there. They had their own um, ch church there. They had a school for a while, a little um, a, a post office. So it was a, a, a viable farming community. Um, haven't found any indication that um, many people from that particular settlement were interned. There was at least one that we know of. <coughs> but um, one of the reasons for um, for being interned was uh, all of the people from with Austrian passports were given um, 
pass books and they had to have their their book stamped I believe it was every month or so and if not they could be liable to uh, be in, uh, interned uh, if they were shown to be indigent you know without a job they could be interned as uh, so, you know looking at that initial regulation it was pretty broad and they, they applied it pretty broadly um, there were also in one of the camps in um, there was a camp at Spirit Lake, Quebec, where there were, and another camp at Vernon, which is um, on one of the, where one of the schools in Vernon is now. Um, there were a total of 81 women and 156 children interned with their families, with their fa husbands' fathers at those camps in Spirit Lake, Quebec, and at Vernon. But most of the camps were only, only men. Uh, just those two that uh, that had women and children involved. So, um, Revelstoke, uh, a lot of the communities were actually looking uh, for opportunities to have camps, and because Revelstoke did have National Park here, um, and because the the government was was trying to keep most of the camps within park boundaries. This became that they had a, a case to make for having a, a camp on Mount Revelstoke. The uh, community was, um, uh, and Mount Revelstoke had just been declared national park in April of 1914, so it was quite a new park. Uh, but one of the projects that um, they'd started even before it became a national park was to build a uh, auto road to the summit of Mount Revelstoke, and that was ongoing at this time. So the locals saw it as a, um, a, a good economic um, driver for the community uh, to be able to, you know, if they were supplying food and supplying um, equipment and construction of the camp uh, and then having people available at very low cost to work on road construction, the local community saw it as a, a very positive thing. Uh, so they, they really um, worked uh, for that. Um, just um, I'm jumping back and forth here between some of the, um, some of the, the local uh, things and the internment camp program as a whole. Uh, one of the things that Otter said in his report was that um, in terms of discipline, he said, um, a little complaint can be made. There were, of course, a number of very vicious and insubordinate characters with whom stringent measures had to be adopted, particularly when the daily ration of food was reduced, and again over a question of what constituted obligatory and what constituted voluntary labor, resulting in each instance in an incipient insurrection easily quelled. Apart from the natural irritation consequent upon a deprivation of liberty, the general disposition of prisoners was philosophical acceptance of the situation, the policy adopted being that of humane treatment throughout. And uh, certainly some of the research that's been done by the Ukrainian community would uh, question that, that statement. Um, the prisoners were also expected to pay for their, their clothing, and the average cost of that was $24.39 for their clothing. So that had to come out of their 25 cents a day. Um, the underemployment in the, the uh, auditor's report, it said, at, at times objection was taken by many to doing their own chores. And while much work for the government was performed in the following directions and considerable advantage gained, the enthusiasm shown was not very great as might be expected. <laughs> so, you know, they were basically slave labor and, and they're uh, complaining that they weren't enthusiastic about, about it. Uh, a total of 107 prisoners died during internment. Six of those were killed while attempting to escape, but most of them died of uh, disease. 26 died from tuberculosis. Um, in 1916 and 1917, when the uh, regular uh, the regular workforce um, throughout the country was depleted due to so many men sign up for overseas service. Uh, 6,000 of the prisoners were released and uh, signed parole and worked in general labor uh, to try to build up the, the general labor forces that were depleted with the, the war effort. 
Uh, so in uh, May of 1915, the council asked um, for an internment camp to be placed here, and they were sending a uh, petition to um, Prime Minister Borden and the member for uh, Kootenai. They said it would relieve the labor situation and remove menace. But the city council last night passed a resolution asking the Dominion government for the internment of enemy, uh, alien enemies who are living in Revelstoke and District. A copy of the resolution will be sent to Premier Borden and to RF Green, Member of Parliament. The resolution was proposed by Alderman McSorley and seconded by Alderman Bell. Speaking to the resolution, Mr. McSorley said that he advocated the internment of all Austrians and Germans. One of his reasons was the existing labor problem. The question had been taken up by Western mayors, and he thought it was important to Revelstoke. There were probably 200 Austrians working close to Revelstoke, while in the town itself there was much unemployment. He thought that the government should intern the Germans and Austrians, and so give good citizens a chance to get work. The Austrians and Germans were a menace to the community, he stated. Um, and there was no indication of that. They were, you know, they were working on their farms, a lot of them, the men were working in the forest industry and on the CPR. Um, there, was, there was no indication that there was any menace. And as it turns out, um, there's really no indication that, in, that, that more than one or maybe a, a small handful of people from the, the local Ukrainian community were ever interned. Um, in um, July of 1915, the Robert Green, our Member of Parliament, addressed a public meeting arranged by the Board of Trade, which was the forerunner to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, Thomas Kilpatrick, who was in the chair, said that the object of the meeting was to endeavor to secure some benefit for Revelstoke. The city had contributed men and money for patriotic purposes, and it was felt that it, it had not received as much in return as other places. It had tried to secure a military training camp but had not succeeded on account of large camps having been adopted. He thought that an effort should be made to obtain an internment camp. Shell making would also no boat be dope, would also no boat dope be referred to. There were in the city manufacturers who could supply boxes for the shipment of munitions. And this was another matter in which the city was interested. That never happened, the, the boxes for munitions, but the internment camp did. Um, so uh, by uh, July, of, uh, end of July of 1915, they had gotten approval for the camp here and the site had been selected. Uh, it said the establishment of, of a camp for interned aliens in the Revelstoke Park was arranged for on Thursday by J.P. Harkin, Commissioner of Dominion Parks, uh, who in company with W.W. Corey, Deputy Minister of the Interior, arrived in the city on Wednesday and left for the east on Thursday night. On Thursday, Mr. Harkin and Mr. Corey drove up the automobile road and selected a site for the internment camp. The spot chosen is where the present road camp stands, about eight miles up the <coughs> automobile road. Mr. Harkin afterwards telegraphed to General Otter, saying that he had selected a provisional site and asking that the military authorities in charge of interned aliens inspect it. As soon as the approval of the military authorities is received, Work will be started on preparing the camp for the reception of the aliens. War prisoners are not criminals, says Mr. Harkin, but are in many cases merely citizens of countries with which the Empire is at war, who happened to be in Canada at the time that hostilities were declared. Under international law, they may not be treated as ordinary prisoners, but are entitled to certain considerations. Um, that may not have happened. Um, uh, so this was a plan um, that was uh, that was prepared uh, for the camp, and uh, the name at the bottom of that is Mander. Uh, that's a misspelling of Maunder. Fred Maunder was the first superintendent of Mount Revelstoke National Park, and uh, so he would have been involved in the the placement of uh, the buildings on the park. Now. They're building it on Mount Revelstoke, which is steep. So, you know, right from the very beginning, there were a lot of, of concerns about uh, how they were going to place everything, how they were going to uh, build the buildings. Um, this was um, a, a picture.
from the National Archives of Canada of uh, General Otter, who, as I mentioned, was the head of the internment operations, <coughs> visiting the um, New Mount Revelstoke camp in August of 1915, said he found the campsite cramped for room and a difficult place to work. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, after his visit, uh, said that General Otter suggested more windows in the bunkhouses, uh, said on the campsite, two log bunkhouses, 60 feet by 25 feet, have been erected. Also a mess house, 60 feet by 35 feet, a cookhouse, 30 by 20 feet, and a hospital, 20 by, 24 by 20 feet, with an orderly's room and a dispensary attached. Said the foundation for the wash house had to be made of canvas and outside the wire entanglements on the lower side of the road to facilitate drainage that in hot water for washing clothes will be provided. There was also a 16 by 14 foot cabin with a six foot veranda for the camp co uh, com uh, commander. And they were also planning to build a, build a, a log storehouse. So, uh, this is also uh, from the National Archives of Canada showing the buildings. And you can see right there the difficulty of uh, building buildings of that size into uh, hillsides. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, drainage would have been a, would have been a problem too. Uh, and um, so, in the August of um, August twenty fifth, nineteen fifteen, the newspaper announced that the uh, military guards will be arriving. Uh, it said the buildings to house the aliens and and the barbed wire entanglements are now completed. The water supply has been obtained by tapping a creek, and a tank holding two hundred. Uh, 2,500 gallons has been installed above the camp, giving ample fire protection. Military guards will be in tents, but a building has been erected for an officer's mess. And said that Otter, when he had uh, come here for uh, his visit, was strongly impressed with the scenery and with the value of the timber in the vicinity. It is a um, so the the plan was to uh, bring the enemy aliens. Um, as soon as possible after the camp was completed and have them there until maybe the end of November, early December, uh, when it became too difficult in terms of uh, snow conditions and then move them to another camp and then return them in the spring. Uh, they were here for that, uh, that fall, but never did return. The camp was only in use for uh, September to December. Here. Um, that, uh, mentioned that uh, said the lighting of the camp this was from the august 25th the lighting of the camp will probably be by gasoline flares at the corners of the wire entanglements with lanterns to light the buildings the proposal to light the camp by electricity supplied by the city has been under consideration the city council offered to supply supply the light at a particularly cheap rate but captain palmer finds that the cost of installation would be a prohibitive so by um, August 28th, it was announced that the Infantry Guards and Army Service Corps uh, had arrived. They had a military march to the alien internment camp in the park. So the aliens will arrive at the beginning of the week. And uh, they were, um, so it said, um, 56 men of the 102nd Regiment Rocky Mountain Rangers arrived from Kamloops under the command of Captain Wayne who will act as camp command, camp command, commandant until the arrival of Captain Rose next week. Uh, some of the other officers were Lieutenant A. Grant of Revelstoke and Lieutenant Richards of Mara. And they had a couple of uh, local men as buglers, uh, R. Gordon and J. Bourne. Um, and said a lot of the large proportion of the soldiers were from Revelstoke. So the infantry company marched to the camp yesterday and occupied bunkhouses for the aliens, and they will soon be occupying tents. Uh, it said that uh, Lieutenant Splinford of the Canadian Army Service Corps is in command of a detachment consisting of an acting sergeant, acting corporal, four drivers, three general duty privates, one cook, and an orderly, and they had come to take charge of the supply department. Um, and it said all supplies will be perched at purchased in Revelstoke. So that was definitely good news for the, the local merchants. 
Um, so they had uh, contracts with uh, G.W. Bell, who's a baker, for bread, uh, P. Burns and Company uh, for meat, and the, Mer Bean, the Burns Meat Market is uh, where um, uh, Revy Outdoors and Conversations is now in that building. Uh, they also had a contract with Frank McCarty for feed, L.C. Mason for groceries, and they had a temporary office in the vacant store uh, next to Mason's grocery store. And uh, they'd rented a house next to a uh, Manning store on McKenzie Avenue for the office quarters and the storehouse. That house is no longer there. That's where uh, the Village Idiot is now. Uh, so the, the camp was, um, was inspected and was ready to go. They uh, installed a telephone line and uh, were just awaiting the, uh, the, the, the prisoners to arrive. So uh, the newspaper of September 8th um, noted that um, aliens from Vernon uh, were coming to the internment camp. It said 50 Austrians, and remember when they say Austrians, they're, it's usually Ukrainians. So 50, 50 Austrians <coughs> arrived from Vernon at midnight on Monday, and on Tuesday were taken to the internment camp in the Revelstoke Park. They were escorted by a detachment of the BC horse under the command of a lieutenant. Uh, they remained in the railway car until the morning, and then they were marched to the park under guard. It said the aliens were a sturdy lot and had a well-fed appearance. They will start work on the automobile road tomorrow. And there's a, a picture of uh, the, some of the, the tents, so that would be sort of the officers' tents at the camp. <coughs> so by sep September 11th, said uh, 100 aliens working on automobile road, another detachment of 50 Austrians from the alien internment camp at Vernon arrived in the city on Wednesday night, and today with the 50 who arrived on Monday are at work on the extension of the automobile road in the Revelstoke Park. The aliens who arrived on Wednesday were under the escort of a guard from the British Columbia Horse. They were met at the station by Captain Wayne and an escort from the 102nd Regiment, and in the morning marched to the internment camp on the mountain. Yesterday was spent by them in burning brush and clearing up the camp surroundings and today they are at work on the automobile road. 100 aliens are now at the camp and a further party of 125 Austrians from Brandon, Manitoba is expected to arrive in the immediate future. Uh, so by uh, September, just a week after that, there were 200 aliens and 75 guards in that camp. And you know, just from the pictures, it's not a lot of room there. Um, so the newspaper said 100 aliens from Brandon and 20 additional guards from Kamloops <coughs> arrived in the city yesterday and are now in the alien internment camp in the Revelstoke Park. There are now 200 interned aliens in the camp, two of whom are Germans, two Hungarians, and the rest Austrians, read Ukrainians, and 75 guards, 75 guards and 200 prisoners. Um, that's even higher than the ratio of uh, infant toddler uh, uh, <laughs> caregivers to the babies. Um, so it said 100 <coughs> aliens came from Vernon and 100 from Brandon. But the guards from Kamloops arrived in command of Sergeant C. E. Moon. Um, and it, it, again, it says the aliens were a sturdy lot. One young fellow carried a violin and a bow of his own manufacture on which he played while waiting at the station. Uh, but then they said, Work on the automobile road has been lately hindered by bad weather. There was snow at the camp during Monday, and there has been considerable rain. So this is mid-September, halfway up Mount Revelstoke. So guess what? They're getting snow um, and rain. Um, and it, it turned out that most of the time spent by the prisoners was uh, shoveling snow and cutting firewood. They maybe did a couple of miles of work on the road, but really not much more than that. And of course, they were only there for a couple of months as well. Um, in the um, middle of September, there was a special meeting of the Board of Trade. They uh, were really pushing <coughs> to keep the internment camp operating over the winter. And um, they said that they could uh, put the prisoners in the agricultural grounds, which is uh, where the, um, um, the golf course is now 
and the agricultural building, which is now the golf club house, and a couple of, at least one other building that was on that site, and uh, said that um, they would offer um, the offer use of the buildings free of charge. We really wanted to keep the prisoners here because they really saw the economic benefit to having the, <laughs> the having it in camp. Uh, but uh, Major Palmer, uh, who was there um, from the military, said that it wasn't their intention to keep the camp on the mountain longer than two months due to the difficulty of transportation of food. And uh, said the aliens could not work on the mountain in the winter. There was lack of space for exercise ground and the possibility of the water supply freezing, all considered drawbacks. <laughs> um, he said that um, they, they would consider the agricultural grounds, but they weren't really in favor of that. And um, not all members of the Board of Trade approved because some thought that uh, having this 25 cent a day workforce would uh, uh, be a detriment would be competing with local labor of uh, the good people <laughs> as they mentioned earlier um, so it was definitely a debate um, they were asking at one point if the uh, the interned people could work on city projects and the government said no they were trying to keep all of the work under the dominion control so that's why they they had the camps in the, the um, Dominion parks because they were under the control of the Dominion government and they wanted to keep it that way whenever possible. Um, it was actually a, a, somebody from town uh, decided to write a poem about the, the camp. And um, occasionally there was local poets who would produce their work in the local newspaper. So this one is called At the Foot of Mount Revelstoke. The prisoners are interned upon the hill. Austrian and Hun and Turk, while armed men patrol with steadfast step and eager ken, stemming the tide of Kaiserdom until the Allies blast the roots of that foul tree whose shade polluted Europe many a year, whose fruits, the widow's curse, the orphan's tear, now falls, alas, all too abundantly. At curfew bell, I sometimes faintly hear the martial bugle visioning that war of stagnant trench and bloody fray afar on Flanders fields and Austrian mountains drear, or where and violet under walls of steel, the silent watchers guard the mighty main, where British bulwarks dominate again and hold von Tirpitz under hatch at Kiel. Of course, there's a lot of military references in there. Then night falls and over Begbie's trifold crown appears a lonely star emblem of rest and peace to tired nature. Grant it best, O Lord, that from thy lifted throne, peace may descend a troubled world to still, peace with an open and eternal smile, arrayed to guard the future. But meanwhile, the prisoners are interned upon the hill. That was written by somebody named O.P., but we don't have his, uh, his full name. Uh, So again, the city was really trying to press the, the use of the, um, the agricultural uh, buildings for a winter camp, and they offered free lumber and water and light, but um, again, the uh, Dominion government turned that offer down. Uh, it, uh, this was a letter from the member of provincial parliament, Thomas Taylor. He said, I note further that the city of Wired to Colonel Otter with a view of having this particular camp continued in the city of Revelstoke for the winter. And I will be glad to do anything that I can to insist you in attaining this object. May I point out, however, that the offer of your city to employ on an average of 20 men per day during the winter is not at all likely to be entertained. Because as I understand it, the Department of Justice at Ottawa have absolutely refused to accept similar offers from any corporation, and that any arrangement made must of necessity be such a one as can be made for the employment of these people by either the provincial or the Dominion governments. And you will naturally see the reason for this, as if they allowed them to be employed by corporations, it might lead to abuse. Uh, so even as uh, early as October of uh, 1915, they were making arrangements to uh, transfer the camp from Revelstoke to Yoho Park for the winter months. 
the Chamber of Commerce sent a telegram to their MP, Robert Green. We strongly protest against the camp being moved from Revelstoke, as many prisoners available elsewhere for work at field. Men here in ordinary winter will only be out of employment for a short time. If important work at field to be done, this cannot be completed during winter. Permanent camp only should be established at field and permanent camp at Revelstoke. But uh, Otter says, um, uh, while acknowledging the generosity of this offer and expressing the thanks of the Honorable Minister of Justice, I regret to inform you that arrangements have already been made for the removal of the personnel of this camp to Yoho Park for the winter, where work has already been provided for them, and therefore it will not be possible to meet the wishes of your council. Um, so, um, and, and there was, by uh, the end of October, uh, 25 aliens had left uh, for field, escorted by a guard of six privates and one non-commissioned officer. Uh, and uh, they were sending them out a few at a time. By November 6th, uh, it was noted that there were 12 degrees of frost at the internment camp on Sunday night. The ground was frozen hard and road work was practically at a standstill, although some woodcutting is being performed. Acting on instructions from Ottawa, nine aliens were released from the camp on sun Saturday. They had satisfied the authorities that they were of Serbian nationality. Um, and then so 50 aliens will leave for field under a guard of 20 at the hundred of the 102nd RMRs in charge. Uh, the remainder of the aliens and guards will probably be removed within the next fortnight. Uh, on November 13th, it was reported that 75 aliens remained at the camp. It says it is expected that they will be moved to field in about 10 days. The weather at the camp is frosty and not much road work can be done. Uh, and then so 13 aliens from Edgewood arrived in the city last night. Edgewood on the Arrow Lake uh, also had an internment camp for a short period of time. So um, by uh, the end, by um, December, middle of December 1915, the newspaper reported that the internment camp on Mount Revelstoke is a thing of the past. On Monday, the balance of interned aliens, 75 in number, were taken to the camp near field. 47 guards under Lieutenant Grant escorted the aliens. The balance of the guards left for Kamloops the same day. Um, the, the park superintendent, Fred Maunder, uh, did a report for the probably the month of October uh, of the work done by the aliens and he said cutting wood for the camp 249 days making sled for hauling wood six days cutting timber for props so bunkhouse will not collapse from snow 24 days <laughs> making snow plow six days shoveling snow 12 days as will be seen there was none of this work performed on the auto road extension <laughs> So it was pretty clear it probably wasn't the best idea at the time. Uh, so the next year, the city council was again really uh, petitioning for the camp uh, to be returned here, but that never never happened. Um, so this is a picture that was taken in 1920, March of 1920, of the officers' uh, quarters <coughs> at the camp. So they were completely abandoned by then. So we, we don't have a, a lot of artifacts. Uh, a lot of the information that I got was gleaned from the local newspapers. And uh, we have uh, two specific uh, particular artifacts that we now have in the Mount Revelstoke exhibit that's downstairs. You're welcome to stop and have a look at that on, on your way out. One of the artifacts is um, a dinner bell, uh, just a triangle dinner bell that was used to summon people for, for meals that came from the camp. And uh, the other artifact that we have is a, quite a beautiful carved uh, walking stick. And it was presented to a local man named J.P. Sutherland. Um, I know of at least three of these canes that are in existence. Um, they that, uh, possibly carved by one particular uh, internee at uh, the camps. And it's quite ornate. It's got like a, a snake circling the, the cane and a very ornately carved snake. And the head is a, a bird on one side and a dog on the other side. So 
So I encourage you to go and have a look at that in the display case downstairs. But other than that, not a lot remained. And uh, even um, up to a few years ago, um, when there was an archeological study done of the camp, this was produced oh, longer ago than I thought, this is March 2009, um, produced by Peter D. Francis, who was the archeologist for Parks Canada working out of Calgary. And uh, it took them actually quite a while to determine the exact location of the camp. Over you know, 90 years, it had been kind of uh, lost, uh, or nobody knew exactly where, where it was by that point. Uh, there was a, a uh, interpretive sign at, is it at the Snow, snow Forest? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's further out. Oh. It's, uh, it's up at the, what do you call it, what the Eagle Pass viewpoint now? They used it's, to call it. Yeah. But it, it, was it originally at the Snow Forest? No. No? Okay. No, it was up at the Okay, so um, it, when it was put there, it, it didn't say exactly where the camp was because nobody knew at that point. And it was placed uh, farther up the mountain than the camp actually was. And um, the uh, archaeologists spent a lot of time in here uh, going through records, trying to uh, figure out where it was. They were looking at photographs, and it was Mr. Polster here who finally helped them determine the exact location by looking at the foliage on the trees mm. and determining uh, where those trees would have been um, because he said if it was higher up, you wouldn't have found that kind of vegetation mm -hmm. there. So can you speak a bit about it? Well, there were two things. There was one was an article that talked about the lack of water at the camp and the fact that um, it was practicable, practicable is that the word, to run a pipe from Bridge Creek um, and those of you that know the mountain now know that the trail that goes to, to Broken Bridge mm -hmm. was probably the water line that they were working on for the camp. And the other thing was the vegetation, as Kathy says, uh, in the photographs you can see uh, white pine, which doesn't occur uh, higher up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to sort of drive along the road and look in and I saw a cut stump. And that was my key to go into the, the forest at that location and, and find it. Kathy, can you go back, back a few slides to that picture of all the men standing on the... Yeah, that one. So after I had, had sort of determined, yes, this was indeed the location of the camp, and I was standing there with a copy of this photograph in my hands, and I looked down and I realized I was standing on a rock in the bottom of the stairs wow. in this photograph. Yeah. So it's pretty... Yeah, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, so quite a cut there. Yeah. Well, a lot of the the camp was, you know, sort of cut off. The guard stuff, you know, if you go back, just one. All that guard stuff was cut when they widened the road. So uh -huh. you, you know, you have like half of a tent platform sort of area. It's not very obvious. Um, so it's not it's not really obvious. And then of course the vegetation has grown up. You got you know. You say almost hundred year old Douglas fir is growing out right in the middle of the thing. I, I always, I always, I don't know if you'll get to this later, but I always had a question about well, what happened with the buildings? And for a long time, Parks tried to maintain the buildings, and they said it was an enormous amount of work going up there and shoveling the roofs all the time, shoveling the snow off the roofs. Um, and I couldn't find out what these beautiful big log cabins. You know, I mean, what happened to them? And, uh, and I asked the, the historians that were going to Ottawa at one point to see if they could find anything out. And they found a letter from the park superintendent of the day requesting the use of the wood from the, the cabins to build the bridge at Bridge Creek, further up on the road. So that's where the cabins went. <laughs> yeah. So where is where is the camp? Yeah. Yeah. Is the, is the new sign at the right place now? No. No. And uh, purposes at this point, they have uh, the current decision is not to mark it. Uh, there's not a lot left there. Um, but even in the years since this study was done, there's been little things that have gone missing. Um, you know, even sort of just little pieces of metal and that. So uh, they're they're a little bit reluctant to to mark it. But uh, I don't think that's a yeah. That may change at some point, but the current decision is not to uh, to mark uh, the location. And roughly how far up is it again? 
Well, you know, it's a secret. Eight miles. Eight, eight miles. Eight miles. Eight miles. Okay, so it's well out there. Yeah, so, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot left, but um, the archaeologists were able to you know, find what was there and mark. Uh, they took a lot of photographs. Uh, there was this was uh, possibly a an outdoor oven. That was that was at the officers' mess. Okay. okay. There were two stone ovens built, one inside the wire and one outside the wire. And this one was the one that, where the officers' mess was. Okay. Yeah. If anybody wants to see more detail, we do have this report available. Uh, so the the Ukrainian community as as a whole has uh, really worked hard over uh, the last many years to have uh, national recognition that this did actually happen. And uh, there's been a, uh, I believe it's a formal apology, and there has been um, something called the First World War Internment Recognition Fund. So because it was so long ago, there was no money given to individuals, but there was a fund created for the uh, community to um, uh, educate people about this event and uh, create exhibits and um, do the film and, uh, and other educational uh, opportunities. So this is actually a museum that was opened in uh, Banff a few years ago. And Ken and I went to the, the opening of that. It was quite a moving uh, ceremony. They had a lot of um, Ukrainians from Calgary and Edmonton there including a lot of, um, of uh, religious um, leaders from the uh, Orthodox and Catholic communities. They had, you can see there's, uh, they were members of the Ukrainian choir from uh, Edmonton there. Um, and you can see there was a lot of people who were, it meant a lot to them to, to have that. So this is the, the, the museum that was built specifically for this uh, subject at Banff. Uh, these are some of the displays inside there. So if you were in Banff um, at the Cave and Basin, um, that's, it's right above the, the Cave and Basin area. Uh, and then another thing that they did uh, was uh, in 2014, they had these plaques made to um, recognized the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the uh, internment operations it, um, that had started in 1914. And we do have a plaque, it's not currently on exhibit, but we do, we do have one uh, in our museum as well. Um, and there is a lot of information at internmentcanada.ca. And as I say, I think that that film is uh, available for screening now in a couple of places. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions? Just a quick one, not detail, but the camping field, like, did it last, like, it's not that nice in winter there either, like, did it? I'm not sure how long the field one was there. Uh, there's actually a book, uh, we've got it in our reference library called Park Prisoners, okay. that talks about all of the, the um, national park camps, uh, and that one would have a little bit more detail in that, about how long that one lasted. On a related matter, do you know if there were any local people from the Ukrainian community who were in the Canadian Expeditionary Force? Uh, or has it come up? I don't know. Do you? I don't remember. I don't remember seeing. Ken's done a lot of research on the, the local people who signed up. I'm not aware. We'd have to. I'd have to double check. Just curious. I'd have to yeah. double check and see if there were any. They probably didn't allow them to sign up. I think throughout, uh, and, and that, was, that was another issue because a lot of the um, Ukrainians in Canada wanted to sign up, yeah. you know, and uh, I think some of them did, but uh, it, there were, it wasn't that easy for them to do, so. Kathy, <coughs> was there metal on top of the roofs of the houses at all? That one picture yeah. looked like it was metal. Yeah, it was. It was, like it was just picture. wood. It was wood? I think it was just wood. Like That's my understanding. Just wood? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That one picture from the, um, the National Archives, it looked like it could have been metal, but... Yeah, because there was no snow on it. Okay, one more. Okay, what made you go try and find the location? You, is it your job? Yeah, it was my job. With the park or with... With parks, okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, I was... 
intrigued by this mystery of why we could not find <laughs> location, you know, and, I, and, and I know stuff grows up really fast and yeah. gets buried really quickly in this forest here. Um, but it was kind of a, okay, I've got some time, I can do some research and then I can go and see if I can't find it. And I did. That's yeah. really but that was after three or four other attempts by the archaeologists and, and yeah. my predecessors to try and locate it. You know. Yeah, it took quite a while to figure it out. Everybody was very happy when you got, did that. Uh, just a couple of little announcements here. We're having our um, annual general meeting of the Revelstoke Museum and Archives Association today at 5. And um, the meeting won't be too long. After that, there will be um, appetizers made by our board chairman, uh, board president, Jan Morehouse. I can guarantee they're really good. And uh, usually it's enough, to, it's enough for supper, let me just say that. And there'll be wine, too. Unless too many people come, <laughs> but usually there's lots of food there, and it's really good. Uh, that's worth coming for on itself, but then you also get to hear about uh, what we've been up to at the museum over the last year, and I'm doing a little slideshow on what the museum looked like, you know, going back to 1974 when we first moved into this building and how we've progressed over the years. So. Um, if you're not a member, you can take a membership down the stairs. It's $25 or $40 for a couple. And there's some good benefits. We can tell you about those downstairs too. Um, we're doing a chili and bun ski event on, a uh, ski history event on February 4th at 6.30. It's just $10. We've got tickets available now. Um, it's a good deal. Get dinner and a talk. And um, if you want to try to win a free ticket, I'm doing a poetry challenge. I've got that on our Facebook page and also in the hallway. So uh, if anybody writes me, writes a poem about that woman skiing in heels, uh, you'll get entered in the draw to win a free ticket. So we have I've got a couple of entries, two entries from one person already. And they're on our Facebook page if you want to see your competition. And then uh, the day after that, Continuing with the ski theme, we're doing a talk on the Nels Nelson and other ski heroes. So I encourage you to check out our other events too. Do you have a well, I was just going to say, um, just to connect with all of you, um, Ken's family um, operated a, uh, his grandparents operated um, the Gummo Lumber Company in the around Hector Lake, which is in east of Field in starting in 1917 and so we can go back now and find you know, the quicksand springs where they got their water and we can go through old photographs and we just sort of deduced that some of the people that came to work for them in their small small operation were coming out of internment camps they were you know pictures of um, Eddie Sutra and, and who was a blacksmith somebody else, Elsie Cater, who was a cook, and I don't know what, if, if those are changed names, but those are some of the names of the people that worked with them. And indeed, the only reason that Ken's grandfather, we found out, found out about the timber birds available to entrepreneurs who wanted to live in the wilderness, was um, that he was in the Royal the military, what the, the RMR, the uh, Rocky Mountain Rangers. Rocky yeah. Ma well, and so he was transporting prisoners of war. Uh -huh. The early part of so uh, these things we're guessing at, but mm -hmm. no. So that's how he found out about. And then he didn't want to do that anymore, so he went AWOL mm -hmm. and then started this lumber operation. But you know, you <laughs> so so to sort of put yourself back into that time so many factors. There's the fear that rules over the society mm -hmm. because of sending their young men off to war and, and then trying to look at what kind of spies could be in their midst and there's the language differences. Right. And anyway, so it's a story that we want to keep. Lots of connections. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.